Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Comic Source Podcast. I'm your host, Jace. This is another Spotlight Friday episode, and Comic Boom and I uh, have decided we're going to continue with the uh, DC Spotlights on Friday. So we know you've all been enjoying the Future State Fridays. So we're going to do things a, a little bit different just to kind of let everybody know, make sure we're all on the same page. We had been releasing the Future State Fridays a full 10 days after the, the Future State books dropped. So you had plenty of time to read it. But we've heard from a number of you that it's too big of a gap. Uh, so we're actually going to start releasing our, our DC spotlights the same week. So you got five days to read it, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I guess four days uh, to read it if you listen to uh, the Spotlight Friday on the day it's released. So we're going to start talking about the DC books that come out on Tuesday, that very Friday for you. And I know a lot of people have questions, what's coming after Future State? So um, we have the last week of Future State. That episode's going to drop today, Future State Week 8. But we're also doing um, the, the books that came out this week. So full spoilers, if you haven't had a chance to read your books that came out this Tuesday, March 2nd, you, know, you might want to pause the podcast, go and read them, and then come back. Because we're going to be talking about this uh, with full spoilers. There's not really a way for us to talk about how... DC is starting back up what DC is going to be like with the regular titles post a future state without talking in detail without uh, giving spoilers. Um, so uh, I think Rocky may be a, a little bit more uh, optimistic about it. I think he enjoyed this, this week's title <laughs> a, little, a little more than I did, but God I guess forbid, let's be optimistic, <laughs> right? <laughs> but God, well, I mean, the thing is the books don't feel optimistic to me. Um, they just, God, I mean, and I I will say, so I actually read all the other titles first that came out on, on, um, on Tuesday. And then I read infinite frontier last and infinite frontier actually felt the most optimistic to, of me, uh, to me of all the, the books, the rest of them felt, man, this is, we're going dark. Um, and not even, not even dark in a way that I would say, uh, is like this dark and gritty, you know, everybody always you know, oh, Zack Snyder, he's trying to capture the, the uh, dark and gritty uh, in, in the DCU, the DC movies. He's trying to capture the dark and gritty feel of, of uh, you know, Dark Knight Returns or that sort of thing. This feels mm-hmm. not even dark and gritty. It feels dark in the way like there's no hope. Like we should all just curl up in a little ball and wait for the end, you know, r- real <laughs> nihilistic take. Um, and I don't want to feel that way about DC. DC shouldn't feel that way to me. Um, but that's kind of the vibe I'm I'm getting. But then I read Infinite Frontier, and I did have a little bit more hope, uh, if you will, if we can follow through. If some of the the hints of stories that we're getting in Infinite Frontier, um, if those can play out. So I guess we'll see. Uh, and when we get into Infinite Frontier, you'll see how uh, it's one long story, sort of, but it's almost like little vignettes as Wonder Woman sort of traveling around different parts of the multiverse. So we'll go through it kind of piece by piece, and and Rocky and I'll each talk about kind of our thoughts if we have anything to add. Um, so we're going to start with with Infinite Frontier. But before we do that, I did want to get your overall uh, impressions, Rocky. Obviously, I'm, I'm talking about feeling like there isn't much hope, at least not in the, the titles that I read, right. other than Infinite Frontier. But it seems like you felt a, a little differently. Well, I, I, I think Infinite Frontier, first, let's be clear, Infinite Frontier, this, this, what we're reviewing today, Infinite Frontier issue zero, it consists of 12 separate stories, 11, 11, I guess we can call them short stories. Some of them, obviously, they vary in length. And uh, we have 11 stories plus an epilogue, uh, which is sort of a, a bigger cliffhanger leading, uh, sort of hinting at a larger villain that will, which is the larger threat now in, the, in this new uh, post-death metal DC universe. And I want to be clear here, I might be a little bit of a mischaracterization and that's more on my fault, not your fault that uh, Jace, uh, I'm, I want to be optimistic, but I actually think infinite frontier hints at a great deal of darkness. <laughs> now, normally that's not a bad thing because it's in a typical superhero comic book. It might be somewhat tropey, but the idea is that when you hint at a darkness or reflect darkness, you always have a hint of hope and light on the horizon. And, I guess the one thing about Infinite Frontier Zero, and we'll get into it, is certainly it sets up a great deal of drama, a great deal of darkness. And in fact, it ends with 
the ultimate darkness bad guy that you associate darkness with and we i think i think part of the issues that that we both had and i know i know you in particular is we've had at least a solid solid two years of dc of relentless darkness and honestly i hope we get some hope on the horizon here and uh but i'm i'm not like I'm not, I'm not convinced coming out of Infinite Frontier issue zero that, you know, these are just hints at stories. These are just introducing us to the storylines in the various titles that we'll be talking about. And the mileage here is going to vary in terms of where the hope might be, where there's more hope than others. And I know it's a cliche because people must get sick. At some point they must ask us, why the hell do you guys keep bitching and whining about hope? Hope, hope, hope this, hope that. It's like, it's like Brady and Marsha on the old Brady Bunch show. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Yeah. It's like, you know, with DC, it's hope, 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 hope. Guys quit bitching about hope. You know, drama sells, crisis sells. Yeah, whatever. What we mean by hope is, Stories that feel good at some point where there's some up, something that you can point to where there's some uplifting character moments that put a smile on our face here and there. That's what I'm really talking about. And that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I agree. It's not that we want everything to be rainbows and sunshine and unicorns all the time, because then, yeah, there's no drama. There's no story, but it can't be all depressing all the time. It can't be just the heroes <laughs> losing over and over and over and over we need some happy endings mixed in there. So uh, so yeah. let's go ahead and dive into Infinite Frontier Zero. I do think that if you kind of want an idea of what your co favorite corner of the DC universe is going to be like going forward, you got to pick this up, check it out, check out whatever story applies to that and get an idea of if you like what direction they seem to be hinting that it's going to head in. And that can kind of inform whether or not you want to pick up the, the book or not. So um, huge amount of creators. Uh, so the overall framework is written by Joshua Williamson with James Tynan and Scott Snyder. Uh, the artwork is by John Timms with colors by Alex Sinclair. And then we have the, the little short stories within. So the Justice League portion, uh, Brian Michael Bendis, art by David Marquez, colors by Tamara Bombion. The Superman portion written by Philip Kennedy Johnson, art by Jamal Eigel, colors by Hi-Fi. Batman is by James Tynan, art by Jorge Jimenez, colors by Tomeu More. Green Arrow and Black Canary, written by Joshua Williamson, art by Alex Malieve, color by Jordi Belair. Wonder Woman, written by Becky Cloonan and Michael W. Conrad, art by Aletha Martinez, uh, with pe uh, she does the pencils. Inks by Mark Morales, colors by Emilio Lopez. Star Girl, written by Jeff Johns, art by Todd Knott, colors by Hi-Fi. Wonder Girl, written and drawn by Joel Jones, colors by Jordi Belair. Green Lanterns, written by Jeffrey Thorne, art by Dexter Soy, colors by Alex Sinclair. Green Lantern, Alan Scott, written by James Tynan, Art and Color by Stephen Byrne. The Flash, written by Joshua Williamson. Art by Howard Porter. Colors by Hi-Fi. Teen Titan Academy, written by Tim Sheridan. Art by Rafa Sandoval. He handles the pencils. Inks by Jordi Tarragona. Colors by Alejandro Sanchez. And then the epilogue, written by Joshua Williamson. Art by John Romita Jr. Uh, pencils. Inks by Klaus Janian, Jansen. And then colors by, uh, by Brad Anderson. So basically, the framework story is, is Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman shows up. And this is, uh, you know, right on the hills of, of Death Metal 7. And she shows up and she's introduced to the Quintessence, who we're told are these, these beings who are, you know, like the, the pinnacle of cosmic beings. Think of them in terms of, um, of Marvel as like, you know, Infinity uh, or, or, you know, the, the In-Betweener, the Living Tribunal, like those, those cosmic entities that are sort of outside, which I always think... Uh, Phantom Stranger has been sort of elevated to that. So we get a guardian uh, of the universe who's Ganthet. Um, we also see the wizard Shazam is there. Um, the High Father is there. Um, and the goddess Hera is there. And so basically, after the events of, of DC Death Metal, Wonder Woman has been invited to, to join the quintessence. But she's not sure if she wants to, if she wants to ascend, as it were. And so the Spectre, who's also part of this quintessence, is basically charged with, okay, uh, take her around and show her what's going on in, in the DC multiverse so she can make her decision. Because Wonder Woman's hesitancy is that she was told at the end of uh, Dark Knight's Death Metal that there was uh, a cost, a great cost for restarting the multiverse and a, and a threat that was lurking. And uh, this quintessence is telling her, no, no, there's no, we know nothing of any cost. Um, you know, everything is fine. Don't worry about that. 
come and join us. And so the specter is going to go and take her on this journey. Um, I, I find it interesting that they chose Wonder Woman to be the one to, to go on this journey. Like of all characters, why is she giving the opportunity? I, I would think um, Superman would be kind of a make more sense. And at the same time, we know he would never agree. Maybe that's why they chose Wonder Woman instead, because Superman feels this obligation is going to be to kind of the, you know, the the actual reality, actual people and humans, and yep. you know, keeping that those things working correctly. Um, yeah, so you make I, a good point. You make a good point. Uh, and just to, to quickly add, because and I think that's flowing out of Doomsday Clock. You know, Superman being the North Star of the DC Universe, and it's an it's it's a nice tribute to Wonder Woman here. It honors Wonder Woman, Diana. She's she's really while Superman might have been the North Star of the DC Universe, Wonder Woman very clearly here is the more seems to be more of the moral center here uh, amongst the quintessence and moving forward into this new DCU. Yeah, so then we uh, the first place that she goes and sees, she actually does see Superman. And Superman is is going to these certain disasters, um, and uh, and he's always seems to be just a second behind somebody else who's saving the day. Shazadam, uh, they're calling him, and I know there was rumors that that was Black <laughs> Adam's new name, stupidly done by that site we won't mention. Um, so basically, this is this is Justice League, and Justice League is going to be um, led by by Black Adam. Apparently, one thing that I am glad. Um, I was so worried because we saw at the end of the Shazam uh, series for the future state of Shazam uh, or the Black Adam, I should say, the Black Adam series um, that Black Adam was going to get a chance to go back and sort of fix things with the knowledge of what happens in, in future state. Um, but in that, the, the one thing I didn't like about the is how much they tried to make him look like the rock because the movie's coming out, like just let him be who he is um, with instead of the darker skin and the shaved head. So at least here in the pictures that we're seeing uh, that he his skin tone is, it's kind of in between how we've seen him before, which never made sense when you think about it. He was always this like Caucasian looking guy, but he's from the Middle East. He should have a darker skin color. I get that, but I, I don't like him with the shaved head. So at least let him have his hair. So it looks like we are kind of a, getting a happy medium here, but there was nothing in here that made me think that I'm going to be reading Justice League. Um, if you're a Bendis fan and you think you might like his Justice League, then by all means, but there wasn't really much here to even give us an idea of what the story Bendis is going to try to tell other than it's going to have Black Adam in it. So I don't know well, if you have anything to add, Rocky. Well, I would, uh, I think for, uh, at the risk of being, uh, you know, playing both sides of the fence here, I actually, I, I have mixed feelings about it because I do think that moving forward, I think this is a, a, a comfortable middle ground that I think is a wise one to take. Because frankly, I, to, the, to the larger pop culture uh, narrative in general, uh, Black Adam movie coming out is getting more positive press than everything and than anything right now. Black Adam is taking center stage. They want to prop him up in the Justice League. Bendis even confirmed that in a recent interview is that he was even asked to include Black Adam. And, and I'm, I suspect he wasn't asked i suspect he was strongly told that black yeah. adam is going to be part of the justice league and i think for very good reason and one of and it's very obvious here the entire point of this justice league story was black adam's a good guy all the it, it, it consists of superman and flash uh, you know running around talking to various people and they're they're singing the praises of this of this black adam this shiz adam guy who's saving all these people they're they're trying to establish that black adam is no longer a villain they're making that clear. And that's consistent with the end of future state when Black Adam is sent back in time. Black Adam knows what the future holds, that the unkindness, that this great force, this great darkness of the unkindness will ultimately destroy the universe. And he's sent back and he, he wants he's got we know what his motivation is. Black Adam has motivation to turn the other's cheek. So he's 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 a good guy now or at the at, at minimum, he's an anti hero. Perhaps he, he's probably going to have, be able, have a little bit of his antihero still in him, but he's he's more of a good guy now. And I think that's what this is establishing. And I think this is a, it's an interesting thing moving forward. I think it's going to be good for new readers. In fact, in fairness, if I try to if I try to eliminate my 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 Bendis anti Bendis bias here, <laughs> uh, I, I think that if you're new to comics and you want to check out Justice League, I think this might be a pretty good jumping on point. 
and you might enjoy it because this is different. And particularly if you're if you're just curious about the Justice League and you're interested in the and the pop box office and the D, the new DC sim, cinematic universe going forward, this might be something you might want to check out and judge for yourself and not, you know, I don't there's nothing I hate more than if I'm if I'm the reason somebody, you know, decides not to check out a comic that they might like. So, you know, I'll say that. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is interesting. I wonder had the rock, you know, if, if the rocks profile, if, if whoever is playing black Adam, isn't such a high profile person and isn't such a, you know, I don't know him personally, obviously Dwayne Johnson, but he seems to be such a great guy. He definitely has a lot of good, you know, press. So do you really want him playing a, a villain? Well, well, I mean, black Adam's never been an outright. Well, I guess back in the seventies uh, or even before when he first came on the scene, uh, you know, in the Fawcett comics, he definitely was, the mustache twirler. Uh, but for, mm. for, you know, last couple of decades at DC, he's been much more of an anti-hero than, than anything else. Um, arrogant and, you know, kind of a, almost uh, a Dr. Doom light sort of character where he really, he just wants to protect his country. Um, and it does seem like, yeah, they are trying to make him more uh, heroic, but I hope they don't take him too far because he still, to me, needs to be, he needs to have that arrogance. He needs to, to think about the fact that he wants to protect Kandak. He wants to protect his country. That's his overriding motivation. He wants to be, and not only that, not only does he do it out of a care for his people, but because he wants to be worshipped by his people, because he wants to be seen. He wants that ego stroking. Um, you're adding in the added motivation of he wants, the whole reason he's doing this, um, coming out into the world instead of just protecting his country and, and wanting to protect the overall world is, is because he wants a better future for his child. You know, that's the storyline that ran that's through. Right. That, that technically is not going to be born for thousands of years. Yes. And his wife and his wife is Wonder Woman, for God's sake. Yeah, sakes. a robotic Wonder Woman. <laughs> a robotic so, Wonder Woman. So yeah. it's really, really weird. So yeah. I don't even know how that future is even going to come to fruition. So uh, I have a feeling that this isn't going to end well for Black Adam, but we're going to, we're going to have to wait and see how, what happens. Yeah. So again, I mean, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to buy it, but I'll read my preview copy because it's Bendis. And, and I just don't know that it's going to be you know, executed well, but the ideas are, are interesting enough. As long as you don't take it too far with black Adam, you don't, he, he's not Superman. Don't turn him into Superman. Don't turn him into Shazam. He still needs to have those, those flaws that make him who he is. So exactly. Uh, yeah. Next part of the story is, is the Gotham story. And we see basically the beginnings of a day Arkham day where everything goes wrong at Arkham. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. This is one of those, uh, and we'll talk about Batman 106 later in the episode. This is another one of those where I feel like uh, the, there is no hope. <laughs> There's no hope in the stories that James Tynan is telling right now. Maybe there shouldn't be for Batman stories, but uh, I, I don't know. I was kind of on board with what Tynan was doing after Joker War, and now I just feel like it's it's sinking deeper and deeper into uh, the, the negative. So uh, I don't know. I just did my DCBS order earlier today. I, I went ahead and ordered the next issue of Batman, but I may not be long for, for Batman. It's it may be just too, too dark for my taste right now. So I don't, I don't really have much else to say other than that. What about you, Rocky? Well, I got to say that uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'll probably the most optimistic I am is with Batman. I'm going to, I'm going to go all out here and I'm going to sing this praises. This is a really great setup for Batman. If you're into Batman or maybe if, if, uh, if you're sick of Batman, fine, you're sick of Batman. But I got to tell you that if you want something different, at least with, with Tinian's Batman, he has he's setting up a two year arc. And what this does here in Infinite Crisis Zero, this sets up a breakout at Arkham Asylum. There's a crisis that happens and uh, Bane ends up getting killed with Joker gas. But it's likely misdirection. It's probably not the Joker that kills him, although Joker is likely that the primary suspect is the one who killed Bane because Joker always threatened to kill Bane out of the Tom King run because Joker didn't like the fact that Bane killed Alfred because, you know, Joker thinks you should, you know, you should you should use use the people that Batman loves to torment Batman. You don't just remove them from the chessboard, so to speak. In any event, Scarecrow is the primary villain here, but this the, the breakout of Arkham sets up Simon Saint, this new billionaire Simon Saint that comes into comes into Gotham City to set up the magistrate program that we saw play out in the pages of Future State. And the idea is, is that this Simon Saint wants to set up the magistrate program because he's sick and tired. You know, he, the, the proposal he makes to Mayor Nakano of, of uh, 
Gotham City, the mayor of Gotham City, is that, look, God, you can't always rely on Batman. When's the last time you, you defeated a major threat without Batman? Enough is enough already. Let me use my peacekeepers uh, in order to handle the major superhuman threats. And, and then we'll just use, let the GCPC, GCPD deal with the petty crimes. And this is the setup for what's going to oh, be a, coming out of the Batman comics for the next two years. So, you know, I, I hear you, Chase, Chase, when you, you know, your, your trepidation, but frankly, if <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have a hard time. There's no way I could say that I'm going to avoid buying a Batman comic over the next 24 months. And, and honestly, there's just so much in the plate here, so much that could happen. I'm, I'm on board for this and, and I love James uh, Tinian's art and uh, part of me, uh, Jorge uh, Jimenez's art and James Tiny in the fourth man. I, I really like his writing. I, I, I've been enjoying his Batman run. Yeah, I mean, I am a fan of his, and 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 in the, the 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 vignette we get in the Infinite Zero, you know, we're seeing the fact that he's continuing, much like on his detective run. To it's, this is really the Batman family story, you know. We're seeing Batgirl as uh, you know Oracle. We're seeing Barbara Gordon as Oracle, and and she you know talks about the fact that she's going to be behind the computer and only put the costume on when she's she's really needed because um, she feels like she can do more good uh, as Oracle. Um, and plus it'll give her, uh, it'll go easier on her spinal implant. Um, so, and we see a grifter show up. So it's really, you know, a, a big sprawling story he's telling. Um, I just don't know that it's a story and I'm not saying it's going to be a bad story. I'm just, I think personally, it might not be a story that I I'm that interested in this descent into, uh, into fascism for Gotham. You know, it, it, it's an interesting story and there may be people that, that like it. I mean, bring in Simon Saint. And again, we'll talk about issue 106 in a little bit. Um, but I don't know. It just it's not it's not speaking to me. And, and I'll I'll leave the rest to talk about when we get to, to 106. The next vignette is uh, the Wonder Woman portion. Um, and this would be, um, I guess, just to let us know where Nubia is going to be going forward. Uh, but in a way, sets up Hippolyta being part of the uh, the Justice League, because basically what happens in this story is that Hippolyta tells Nubia, hey, you're going to be the queen of the Amazons because I'm going out into the world. Um, which is really interesting that, I mean, I don't know the reason for this because Wonder Woman's disappeared basically because Diana has disappeared. I mean, Nubia thinks she's fighting to be the new Wonder Woman, um, you know, undergoing kind of a test of courage. And when she sort of passes and everybody else fails, instead of Hippolyta saying, okay, you're the new Wonder Woman, she goes, no, you're the queen of the Amazons. I'm going to go be Wonder Woman. So uh, not sure how this plays into the, the, the story of Yara Floor that Joel Jones is going to be telling. Um, doesn't seem to tie in with the, uh, the story that Becky Clunan and Michael W. Conrad are going to be telling in the pages of uh, the regular Wonder Woman title with Diana, but yet they're the ones that, that wrote this. Um, so I'm just, it's, it's not sure. Wonder Woman herself, we have an idea of, of what that's going to be. Um, Rocky and I do, because we've read the, the first issue of, of, wonder woman that comes out in march issue 770 um but what this means other than just hey it's telling us nubia's the queen and hip uh, hippolyta is going to join the justice league okay i have no problem with that but is is this is there any significance to this story other than just telling us that what do you think rocky uh no there really isn't uh in fact as a long time i'm a i'm a pretty serious wonder woman reader and i'm actually I'm reluctant to really delve into I'm reluctant to do a deep dive into what's wrong with this story because 95% of people won't know really what I'm talking about. I would suspect because it's, it's me nitpicking. I'm, I, I can really nitpick this and to just give you a Coles notes version that the test that, that, you know, everyone knows that Diana's dead and all the Amazons are fighting because they want to be the next Wonder Woman. And they assume that the, the, they assume that there's going to be another contest to determine the next Wonder Woman, which is logical. And to be quite frank, that's kind of what I want as a, as a reader. I think that would be the expectation of the readership. But unfortunately, Hippolyta, the m mother of Diana, is, is in mourning. She has this she has this ridiculous test. And. Uh, <sighs> And the test is she wants all the Amazons who want to be the next Wonder Woman to stare into Medusa, to, to, into the severed head of Medusa and 
and risk basically being turned into stone. Uh, and that apparently if they do that, then you'll show your, your willingness to, to do what, to do what Diana did. But it makes no sense. Diana herself, who is watching this with the specter even acknowledges that even she couldn't survive that. So it seems like a ridiculous test. Any Amazon should know that. Even Nubia should know better than that. Th this this harkens back to the Greg Rucka storyline where one where Diana fought Medusa and, and blinded herself in order to defeat Medusa. It was a great storyline, but it's a, this is an absurd test. This is just this is really if quite frankly Queen Hippolyta was going to appoint Nubia anyway. I think that's clear. Yep. This just seems like a really cheap way to get Nubia. I mean, frankly. I'll put this another way. Nubia is an idiot. By, by If she opened up that chest knowing that she knows that she's going to die if she's opened up, she did it because she trusts Hippolyta and she does what Hippolyta says. And while that might, while that, that might show loyalty and trust that Nubia has with Hippolyta, that also shows a certain degree, I hate to put it this way, but a lack of independence of Nubia. Hippolyta is in mourning. There's no way that Hippolyta should abandon her responsibilities as queen and be Wonder Woman. I think that's irresponsible. And But the fact that she's doing that, I find interesting because it's a character flaw. And I think it's going to come back to haunt Hippolyta. And I think that, so I don't mind that. I think that's an interesting aspect. This is a queen who's abandoning her responsibilities. And I think appointing somebody else, Nubia, I'm sure Nubia will be great. But I I, I like the dynamic, how, how, how we got there, I thought. I would have I would have done it a different way. But overall, you know, you, we didn't really need this. This could have been done in one page. You know, Nubia is, you know, all Hippolyta had to do was appoint Nubia queen and move along. Yeah. And the other thing I I mean, we know Hippolyta. She's been around for years in, you know, especially in the George Perez run. I'm yeah. more interested in learning more about Nubia and seeing more of her. I'd rather her having like I, as much as I wouldn't want to read a Justice League by Bendis. If Nubia was in it instead of Hippolyta you're nudging me in the right direction to go ahead and pick it up. So. Yeah. Well, not only that, I'm going to quickly add that, uh, that one of the most interesting aspects of the Amazons right now was the fact that the Amazons have discovered that there's a third tribe of Amazons in uh, Brazil. And so that's a major like diplomatic discovery and, 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 and discovery historically for the Amazons and for Hippolyta to give up being the queen just at a time when they're looking at expanding their ranks and discovering a new third tribe, uh, I think is a very irresponsible thing for Hippolyta to do. Again, interesting, but I would have I would have incorporated that into the story that I would I would have I would have incorporated Nubia questioning the wisdom of Hippolyta leaving just at a time when the Amazons need leadership the most. And 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 of course, I love that Yara Floor was there. I love the scene with Yara Floor and the young. Of course, she's Wonder Girl here and we know she's going to go and be a, a pretty, pretty great Wonder Woman in, in future state. But in any event. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting, though. It's not really clear to me where exactly she's going. You know, it's 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 basically two pages. Uh, well, three pages, because I think one of them is a splash of her leaving. Um, and there's some other Brazilians that are going to be following her so where... yeah and there's there's sign language i guess it's her mom i guess her mom is deaf i guess yeah, her mom is hearing yeah. impaired yeah. and i guess she's a dreamer and now that's not clear from the from but i only read that in solicits they could have made it more clear in the pages that she was actually uh a dreamer meaning that her parents were illegal immigrants but she was born in america maybe that's implied but it could have been more clear in the narrative itself and but it wasn't. And I, I think that's I think that's a flaw in, in this particular, you know, in this little intro. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I, I, I know that you and Trevor were real excited about Yara Floor. I'm, I'm much less so. I'll give the first issue or two a, a try. Um, but I, I don't know. I just she just doesn't interest me, which is fine. You know, different strokes yeah. for, for different folks. So um, the next one does really interest me because. I mean, are we finally going to get the Justice Society back? We, we are at Justice Society headquarters, and it's basically a, a scene of uh, Alan Scott and his, uh, his kids, Todd Scott and Jenny Lynn Scott. Uh, you may know them better as Obsidian and Jade, uh, first appearing in Infinity Inc. way back in the day. Uh, this one's written by Tynan. And what does it mean? Well, Alan Scott apparently has this new um, 
role that he's been offered, but he doesn't feel like he can accept it unless he comes out and admits that he's gay. So this is from, you know, drawing from the Earth 2, Alan Scott, where uh, when, when that started back up in the New 52, they, they made him a homosexual man. I have no problem with that. Uh, you know, d- doesn't change the character in my mind much, except for the fact that it is always um, strange to me when they have chil- you know, biological children. <laughs> I always wonder, well, wait, if you didn't like women, but uh, especially the era generation he comes from, um, yeah. you know, and he mentions it himself, how he, he had female love interests over the years because he thought that's what he was, quote unquote, supposed to do. You're supposed to have a family. You're supposed to, you know, sire children or whatever. So I thought it was a poignant um, story, but what does it mean? Um, like, what is this role that he's been been offered? Um I'm curious. Uh, I'm definitely curious uh, because I, I love the Earth Two version of Alan Scott. We also had recently the um, the Tales of the Dark Multiverse Crisis story that featured uh, Alan Scott um, becoming this almost like a Herald of Galactus type character for the for the uh, evil god of of Ragnarok, which was was interesting. So we've had some Alan <laughs> yeah. Scott recently. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What this version of Alan Scott will be? Will it? Um, basically portend the uh, return of the justice society. I know a lot of justice society fans hope so, but it, it's, it's unclear, but this, I, I did enjoy this uh, little, little story. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. This, this is nice. I mean, I don't mind it. It, you know, we, we get, we have to expect more and more in comic books. We're going to be getting more, you know, we're getting more diversity in comic books and we're getting more, uh, more of these social issues and the, the, I mean, the reality is, is that in, in today's society, the, the, this, the obstacles that form part of the hero's journey of these heroes, a lot of them are very, very personal and they deal with sexuality and they deal with other deeply personal issues. And this is in part, this is cert- clearly one of those examples. And I think it works here. I think it works here. I thought it was handled very well. I thought it was handled very diplomatically. Let's face it. You got to be very sensitive in today's culture when you handle these types of issues. And I thought that the way T- Tinian wrote this was uh, was was very good, and 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 I enjoyed it, and I'm and I'm looking forward to it, and and you do get a sense, and I got a, I felt for Alan Scott here. I can, I I felt a little bit for him, the struggle that he must have had, you know, because he he's he he's aged a little longer. I think he's he's got a lot of longevity. He's he's an old man, obviously, but he ages very well. And I'm sure that he's got some very interesting stories to tell, given his struggles with his uh, in sort of keeping his sexuality secret and over the years. And there's a lot more interesting stories to tell. And 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 I don't I don't get the sense that this is tokenism. This isn't forced storytelling. This is actually it feels natural. It feels organic. And that's the type of that's that's the best kind of story. Yeah, I agree. What's what's unclear, though, is what I mean, to, in his words, what he says is they've asked me to be a sentinel overlooking the totality of this world. What that means is is the big mystery in, in this this part of the story. So, yeah, no, uh, no, up that's next. Yeah. Up next is uh, Titans, a, a bunch of kids that have been recruited, recruited to go to Titans Academy, taking a ferry across the, the sound to Titans Tower. Uh, and they're just as excited as you would expect them to be. I'm just as excited not to re- read Titans Academy as I possibly could be. I, I won't be touching this with a 10 foot pole. And uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I probably wasn't touching it before uh, I read the future state stuff. I'm just, I'm not a big enough Titans fan to, to really care, to be honest with you. Um, but I know you are a Titans fan, Rocky. So what were your thoughts? Well, well, I am a Titans fan and I, in my, in my best possible worlds, I want, I would love for people to get excited about this as I think there's a little bit of hype over at Marvel with Strange Academy, and I thought that worked really well. I think that's developed very organically. Scotty Young's been doing a really good job over at Marvel with Strange Academy, and it's developing its own fan base with new characters. And I want Titans Academy to be the same thing. The way that Titans Academy, the hints that we've gotten in Future State is I'm a little bit concerned because we got these. We know we're going to get these new carols, uh, these new characters, you know, Brat Girl chaka kubabra or some i i you know god forbid i we we got these new characters that are going to be playing a role 
I also know that they're going to be bullies. At some point, they're going to bully Miguel, who has the H style, into they're going to steal his H style, bully him. They're going to try to use the H style to resurrect Roy Harper. And then the H style becomes perverted. And the, I know that these future students that we get a hint at here in Infinite Crisis Zero, we know from Future State that they end up doing really stupid things. So, uh, of course, we expect that, you know, kids, teenagers will get in trouble, and that's expected. And what I'm what my fear is and what I hope doesn't happen is I, I want to like these characters and I did not like these characters from what I saw in Future State. In fact, I resented them. I thought they were bullies and I, I didn't I didn't like any of them, any of them. And I hope that I see a different side of them that I get to like as Titan Academies continues. And I hope that the focus isn't on Red X. Because in all the spec and all the talk about Titans Academy and all the variant covers, it's always Red X, Red X. Red X isn't a member of Titans Academy. You know, let show me some, show me why I should care about Titans Academy. And that's what my 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 concern is right now. And you know, this was a nice little hint, but we need more of it. But even on the last page here in Infinite Frontier Zero, we see a red X symbol. We see an X on a, on a you know, we see red X seemingly in the background. So is this about red X or is this about the new characters of Titans Academy? I think DC's focus is wrong. And I, uh, that's my primary concern. And I hope I'm wrong on that. It's written by Tim Sheridan. I, I, I wasn't impressed with his future state writing, but we'll see what happens moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with you. I, it was really, it was too much story packed into those two issues. Now he's got a longer runway. I'm hoping that he, he can kind of decompress and, uh, and, and kind of spread it out and have it, yeah. ha, have it pace better. So I guess we'll see. Next up is the Superman section. Oh, boy. Uh, this was probably my least favorite. Um, basically, it hints that the, the Spectre is telling Wonder Woman that, uh, I, mean, I mean, they're there in Metropolis. And it's supposed to be the current time, but it's actually John Kent as Superman. So it's like we're still in the future. And uh, the implication is that John Kent is nowhere ready to become a, a, a superhero. Uh, he may have his father's physical gifts, but that will never, and that's in bold, the Spectre says, but that will never make him Superman. Um, and, and the implication is that he will become a tyrant. Um, and, and some of the things that are that are here in this uh, in this particular issue uh, or part of the issue written by Philip Kennedy Johnson are things that Philip Kennedy Johnson told me specifically when he was on the show. Uh, he says, John Kent is of no place, no time born, uh, conceived on one world, born on another. Now both those are gone, lost uh, in uh, in space for years with a madman, uh, uh, imprisoned and tormented by a, a a version of his father, that being Ultraman when he was on Earth 3, and then comes back and immediately leaves to go a thousand years in the future and, and, and you know, becomes part of the Legion of Superheroes. I mean, this kid's never had a break, and basically that's going to lead him to becoming a, a tyrant. And I just feel like ever since Bendis aged John Kent up, poor John, he's been put through the ringer, and now they're going to turn him into some kind of villain? Like, I hear that word tyrant, and, and turning a hero into a villain. And all I can think of is think back to the Armageddon 2001, uh, where it was originally supposed to be Captain Adam that turned yeah. evil, but then it got leaked out and they changed <laughs> it to, um, to Hawk from Hawk and Dove. Um, God, man. Could, could, and, I, and I get why, you know, and we talked to Philip about it, why he didn't just want to immediately undo what Bendis did and age John back down. But man, could, could, can we... I just wanted a story. I just wanted a DC universe where John Kent could just grow up sort of um, in, in real time. And what I mean by that is like tell stories where he grow, like you, every 12 issues, he's a year older, you know, and, and give yeah. us plenty of time instead of having him go from 10 or 11 to 17. I feel like though, those story, those are the formative years. Um, and so in a way I kind of agree with Philip Kennedy Johnson that yes, all this trauma and everything John's gone through could easily push him into not having a good understanding, not being a good hero, not, you know, becoming a tyrant. But the thing is, I don't want that. I don't want that for John as a character because I care about him as a character. I also don't want that as a fan because we've seen that story a thousand times and I don't think anybody can do it better than it's been done already with things like Mark Wade's irredeemable. 
Yeah. You know, talk I, about an evil Superman. If I want to read an evil Superman, I'll just go and read Irredeemable for the 25th time because I love that story. I read it at least once or twice a year. So I, it just doesn't need to be done. God, God, just leave poor John alone. Um, so th yeah, this one did not, I, I, I didn't like it. So I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts, Rocky? Man, I, I, I got to agree with you. Look, I, the, the bottom line here is, is that I don't know what, what, what it, it seems to me they're trying to impose a Damian Wayne storyline on John Kent. I mean, first of all, just for what it's worth, uh, uh, Brian Bendis went out of his way to establish in the Legion of Superheroes, which is a comic book that most people don't read. But I mean, they, they, they've hinted at in more than one issue of, of the Legion of Superheroes that the, that Damian Wayne is a mini Hitler. He's destined to become a mini Hitler that, that everyone, everyone in the 31st century knows that. And then here suddenly we're now suddenly Superboy. I'm sorry, John Kent's going to be a tyrant. I thought John Kent was the inspiration for the United planets. What yep. changed? This seems completely out of nowhere. It com completely out of whack. Moreover, let me just, I'm, I'm going to say something schizophrenic here for a second. There's one page here where PKJ, Philip Johnson Kennedy, basically, uh, or Philip Kennedy Johnson, he acknowledges all the stuff that we, we bitched about regarding Bendis' storyline. He acknowledges on one page about John Kent, lost in space with a madman, in prison and tormented by a broken version of his own father, came of age 1,000 years after his birth in the 31st century. I've been saying that, we've all been saying that. Like, where's the consequence? Where's the character consequence from that? Where's the follow from that? Bendis has been ignoring that ad nauseum. And, 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 and all of a sudden when we're getting it now, it seems, it doesn't seem, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn because I'm so glad that PKJ is dealing with it and he's dealing with the question. I, I really think that the heart of uh, Philip John, uh, Kennedy Johnson is in the right place. I think he's looking, I think he's listening to us fans. And I think, cause he's re, he's stating exactly what we've bitched about John Kent. Like, how can this, how can you go through that and not have it impact you in some way? And I think that if I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt, he wants to show that this is going to have an impact on John Kent and it bloody well should. The question is, how is it going to play out as a story? Because I can appreciate that, that being the son of Superman brings awesome responsibilities. But I guess what my, my question is, is how do you reconcile that with the continuity that's already been established? But then again, the continuity maybe doesn't mean anything anymore coming since we got new continuity coming out of death metal anyway. So I'm a little, little bit surprised and I, part of me, uh, I don't know. I, I feel so schizophrenic about it. It just bothers me that John Kent was, he was the bright light and Damien was maybe more of the cynical darkness, but now we're, now we're getting some suggestion that John Kent is a tyrant. And it just seems to me that it's, it, it just seems to me a little bit off, but I can understand what I can understand that maybe PKG wants to address it because at least he's not ignoring it. And that's what I respect him for that. He's not ignoring John Ken's past. He's saying, look, this kid went through a lot of bullshit and now we have to deal with some of it. And I'm trying my best to, to not ignore it. And so I respect him as a writer for doing that. The question is, how is it going to play out? I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I think he's earned it. Yeah. And I tend to agree with you, but I, I can't, I can't separate the fact that it, ne it, it shouldn't have to be a thing because it shouldn't have happened. He shouldn't have been aged up, shouldn't have been tormented. It was all, it was all bad. Because at the end of the yeah. day, when you talk about Tyrant Superboy, we have that. His name is Superboy Prime. That yeah. character already exists. This just feels redundant. So anyway, let's move on. Next section is yeah. about uh, Black Canary and Green Arrow. And I think the big takeaway here is Roy Harper's Back from the Dead. Why? Uh, because comics. So where this will play out, don't know. Uh, we, we haven't heard of any Green Arrow title or Roy Harper title or Arsenal title or Red Hood and the Outlaws title, anything like that. So uh, yet to be determined where we'll, we'll see that. So uh, anything to add, Rocky? Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to add. Uh, and this is a theory that I got from uh, from different people uh, at uh, Weird Science DC at the Slack. 
Uh, I believe uh, I have a working theory that I that I've ascribed to. I, I'm not taking credit for it. I got to give that to Jim and Eric at the guys of Weird Science DC. Uh, I do. They've convinced me based on uh, circumstantial and the and the evidence in the in the stories of Future State that Roy Harper is in fact Red X. And so I think it makes sense. I think it flows, and nothing that I see in Infinite Crisis issue zero here is inconsistent with the theory that Red Roy Harper is ultimately Red Red X. But maybe I'll end up being proven wrong on that. But I liked it. I, I thought this was good. Uh, Roy Harper's back. We all want him back. We all want to forget that uh, Heroes in Crisis ever happened. I like the the intimacy between Oliver and Black Canary. It's a nice scene. Uh, in many ways, Oliver and Black Canary, their relationship is in many ways, it's they're, they're, they're sort of like the romance of the DC universe in many ways. You know, we always talk about Superman and Lois and uh, Wonder Woman and maybe uh, Steve Trevor. But the truth is, we always get better romance between Oliver Queen and Dinah Lance. You know, you know, it, it's and so I, I like that. And, and Roy Harper is always good for some sarcastic humor. God love him. Yeah, the only th I mean, I. I fully would buy into him being Red X. The only thing I find kind of strange is if he's if he's Red X and he's in Titan Academy and he's hanging out with a bunch of young teenagers and he's like a full grown guy. I just that dynamic is just weird to me. But I, I guess <laughs> I guess I guess we'll see. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The next section is the Supergirl section by Jeff Johns. I don't have much to add uh, other than just to tell you mean you Star Girl. Star Girl, right? Yeah. yeah. What did I say? Yeah. Supergirl. Supergirl. I heard. Yeah. Supergirl. Star. Yeah. Star Girl. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I will say, you know, much to nobody's surprise uh, and picking Todd Knox to do the artwork. Todd Knox's artwork has this inherent hopefulness to it. It's Jeff Johns. His uh, a lot of times uh, his writing has inherent hopefulness to it. He's writing Supergirl, which, you know, is his creation based on his sister who tragically lost her life in a, in a, a plane crash. Um, and so this just hits all the right notes for a ho hopeful DC. This is the when we talk about having hope. Uh, this is what we're talking about. Not that there isn't drama, not that it's a perfect story, not that there aren't things going wrong. Um, but this is the tone I think a lot of DC fans want. So uh, there is a Stargirl one shot coming. And obviously we have the Stargirl TV show. So um, how much more Stargirl will get in the future of DC, I, I guess that's yet, yet to be determined. Um, anything to add, Rocky? Uh, not much. I, I agree with you. I, I enjoyed it. This was unquestionably the most hopeful uh the most hopeful and colorful even the colors i mean uh uh shout out to hi-fi on the color it was the most colorful like artistically the most colorful story of the entire narrative of the entire comic it was it was it just really shone and and uh you, you know the star girl herself just always smiling in almost every panel she's smiling yeah. like you said the hope just oozes off the page it was it was it's a nice it's nice that they included that in this it needed it yeah next up we get more of the the batman story that we already talked about uh previously so we'll kind of uh, uh just gloss over that because we're going to talk about it more when we talk about batman uh, 106 but we do get our first uh sighting of, of simon saint here and and scarecrow and his um I don't know, pandemic <laughs> costume, I guess. Uh, after that is uh, the Green Lanterns story with Simon Boz and John Stewart and uh, Teen Lantern. I don't have anything to add here. Uh, I think my opinion on Jeffrey Thorne's Green Lantern is is pretty well established at this point. Um, I'll, I'll, I will stay far, far away. So. Yeah, I, I would just add to that is this is very, very redundant. This was very much a waste. I mean, we know from we know from Green Lantern in future state green lantern that that the teen lantern ends up going on a mission assigned uh, at the behest of the guardians she ends up traveling with mogo into a into the void in order to find joe muleen the far sector green lantern and try to find some secrets as to the gauntlet that she has that gives her green lantern powers and this is just all leading up to that. This is really a complete waste of a story. All it is is a conversation between, between all the between Teen Lantern, John Stewart, and uh, Simon Bay Simon ba Baez, and uh, just stating what we already know. Very much a waste of time. I mean, again, beautiful art. I don't want to take away uh, Jeffrey Thorne. 
I, I, I thought the dialogue was good. I thought the art by Todd Nock was good. Uh, part of me that by Dexter Soy was really good. And uh, Alex Sinclair and the colors again, beautiful, very well illustrated and drawn. And, uh, but it was just for, for longtime readers like ourselves, this is very much redundant. This was a redundancy because of we, what we know in future state. Yeah, next up we have one that, that does give us new information. It's the Flash portion. Uh, basically, we find out that Barry Allen's been um, been asked to join kind of the, the omniversal version of the Justice League, Justice Incarnate, uh, to observe the formation of the, the new multiverse uh, after the, the events of Dark Knight Death Metal, um, specifically checking out Earth Omega. So uh, this is Wally West returning to the Flash. Uh, I think what a lot of people have been been waiting for so to me this says that if you pick up jeremy adams flash uh he's he's the writer on the ongoing flash title you're going to be reading about wally west we also know that the uh the non-binary flash from the future state justice league story is going to be making an appearance as well just chambers so what that story is is it wally still trying to atone for uh the things that happen in heroes in crisis i guess we'll we'll see i do hope it's not all wally because I, I am kind of curious so what what does that mean for Barry and Justice Incarnate? Like, because all I could think of while uh, I was reading this, and Barry's saying, "Yeah, he's he's basically going to be based on the moon. He's not going to be on Earth anymore. He's going to be working with Justice League Incarnate." All I could think about was how, over the period of Joshua Williamson's run, that relationship with Iris has been reestablished, and now he's just going to leave her. Like he's a guy going to war, you know, and she's a war widow. Um, well. I think that uh, I can come up. I think I have an answer to that. I'm not saying you're going to like it, but they, with Barry Allen join, joining Justin and in, uh, Justice Incarnate, one has to harken back to multi, Grant Morrison's multiversity and Justice Incarnate. Uh, Calvin Ellis, who is the black Superman of Earth 23, leads Justin in, uh, Justice Incarnate. And there are other uh, characters and there's an aqua woman and there's all, all other kinds of these other characters that make it up, even Captain Carrot of the Amazing Zoo crew. I mean, so, and all of them have their own lives and their own individual Earths. So it doesn't mean that they don't still have their lives in their individual Earths. It just means that their primary focus of work, I guess, their work days, it consists of working in the multiverse and saving in the integrity and protecting the integrity of the multiverse as opposed to their particular earths per se. So I guess, I mean, it's comics, so I can go with that. And I'd be honest, I love this idea. I really love it because Barry Allen is perfectly suited more than any Flash. This has been established in the pages of Justice League and through multiple crises that Barry Allen is the crisis Flash. Make him the crisis Flash. He died giving his life in the original Crisis on Infinite Earths. This guy knows his crises. <laughs> so let him let him relish it as, as a member of the ultimate Flash in Justice Incarnate. That still means that Wally West is the fastest man alive on Earth Designate Zero. That's what I love. I, I, I actually really like this. There's, there's a certain poetry to this and a harmony to it that I like. So that's, that's basically it for the, the short stories. Then we get back to the, the main story of, of Wonder Woman going and facing the quintessence and them you know, asking her, okay, are, are you satisfied? Do you see that there's, there's you know, nothing bad coming? Um, are you ready to join us? And, and you would think that everything she saw, would, would she'd be like, yeah, okay, it's, it's in good hands, all my friends. And instead she says, well, seeing all my family and friends um, and, and knowing they can journey ahead without me, I, I do have faith they can take care of themselves, but... I have to decline your offer. So I, I don't know. To me, it didn't make sense. She, she was saying, yes, they, they all can journey ahead without me. I have faith they can take care of themselves. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I must decline your offer. I'm like, I, I don't, I, I didn't understand why she said no based on what she saw. You know, and her <laughs> explanation is, um, well, seeing so many people you know, embrace their future reminds me that anything is possible. There are, are infinite you know possibilities yeah no I, I agree with you i uh now i i will say that the reason that she gave uh, and she states that when steve trevor washed up on the shores of themiscara i could have sent him back to the world of man alone and stayed behind where i was safe with my sisters instead i traveled with him to an unknown world etc cetera, etc cetera. and so she's doing that the same wonder woman isn't taking the safe route she she's she's not a character she's not a person that likes to be on the sidelines just like her mother 
you know, her mother ultimately, I suppose you could argue with her with her daughter dying, uh, you know, she takes up the mantle of her daughter and and true to form Diana, daughter of, of Hippolyta refuses to, to sit idly by as a member of contestants, just like Hippolyta, her mother would rather be a Wonder Woman as opposed to a queen. Diana herself would rather be in the action as opposed to a, a member of the quintessence watching over the action. She wants to be part of it. And so I think that there's a poetry and a harmony and a symmetry to the characters but, uh, and, a, and a reflection of the legacy between Hippolyta and, and Diana. Yeah, and, and I don't disagree with you, but at the same time, why? I mean, if I'm Diana, I'm like, okay, yes, I will join you and gain all this power, and then I won't sit on the sidelines you know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, that, that's just me. Um, yeah. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not clear yet, at least after having read Wonder Woman 770, which actually doesn't come out till next week. Did you, did you get a chance to read it already, Rocky? Uh, actually, uh, I couldn't find it on the. Okay. okay. I'll have to, I'll have to show you where it is, but, it, but anyway, yeah. but, and, and again, it, it, it starts with, with Diana in a completely different place than this ends with her. And, and, you know, I guess yeah. you don't always have to tell stories you know, in a linear fashion, but we don't know how she goes from the end of this to Wonder Woman 770, completely unclear um, at this time. Uh, there is an epilogue, and Rocky mentioned it before, um, and I will say overall, we haven't talked a lot about the art throughout the issue, but I, I, I think the art is of, of really high quality, especially the colors, and, and maybe that it was the color work more than ever, anything throughout the entire issue that gave me that feeling of hope, because it, it is brightly colored, which I think DC Comics should be now when you talk about the uh, epilogue unfortunately the art takes a big dip in quality in my mind and it is <laughs> the color is colors are also much more muted which sort of uh makes sense because it does end on sort of a downer note um and maybe that's why they picked the worst artist john romita jr to, to draw it um I, I feel like maybe they did because they think his art is good at still because they're clearly they're still paying him to produce artwork for them um but it, God, it just looks so bad. Uh, but anyway, it's the quintessence and they're sitting around going, okay, well, um, we still think Wonder Woman's important. Even if she didn't join us, technically, she's still going to lead us to uh, the next stage. And, you know, Wonder Woman said the, the multiverse is full of goodness, but there will always be, you know, bad things just out of reach. And uh, we should have told her that we already trapped the threat that she was worried about. So <laughs> they, they sort of lied to her. They said, oh, what threat? We don't know what you're talking about. But really, they knew they knew about that threat that existed apparently on Earth Zero or Earth Omega. Um, and uh, supposedly it's the prison for this terrible thing that that is the threat and what that terrible thing is. And again, spoilers, I'm completely going to spoil it for you right now. Infinite Frontier Zero. Um, it's dark side. They're leveling up dark side. Uh, he's no longer just a, a threat that maybe Superman or somebody else like that could handle. He's been elevated to kind of a uh, Galactus level, I feel like, and he should be, and he should have been a long time ago. Exactly. And he actually uh, attacks members of the quintessence, unclear if they sort of survive it. Um, but it looks like uh, at least Hera and Ganthet and the wizard Shazam. Um, and I'm not sure who that other, uh, the other person. Phantom, is. Phantom Stranger? No, because Phantom oh. Stranger is to the right. I'm looking at that. Uh, fan, oh, well, the Phantom, Phantom Stranger and Spectre do get stabbed in the in the next panel, yeah. um, but anyway, they, they all they all oh it's it's High Father that's who it is it's Shazam and right. or the the Wizard Shazam and then High Father they basically all of them eventually get stabbed in the back by this sort of malevolent darkness um, that is Dark Side and he, he basically trods upon their their fallen bodies, saying uh, you know the the multiverse is infinite but I'm finite i'm final dark side is the end um, and i love the fact that it's dark side is dot 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 playing off tom king and mitch garrett's uh mr miracle it was always dark side is dark side is dark side is now we've got the end of that sentence the end um and it's to be continued in infinite frontier number one coming in july 2021 so um yeah dark side has been leveled up how and why and, and all that and does it make sense um, I guess that that's yet to be determined. I think the last time we saw Darkseid was in the pages of Justice League Odyssey, um, where he was a member of Justice League Odyssey. Um, and, yeah. and he, you know, he certainly, you would have thought he would have played a bigger role in, in death metal as powerful as he is. Um, 
So, yeah. uh, and, and I don't know that this necessarily makes sense with where we saw him in, in uh, future state immortal wonder woman either, where he seemed, you know, he couldn't stop the end from coming. He didn't seem all powerful. Like he, he apparently is here, but I'm all for it. I think dark side, it makes a, a great villain. He should be, he should have a higher profile in the DCU. He should be the villain. Um, and he's not, I think the villain of the DCU is the Joker to be honest with you. And he, he, yeah. he should be nothing. I've talked about it a bunch of times. If, if Batman really existed in real life and the Joker really existed in real life, based on everything we know of their history and their origin and their physical capabilities, Batman should defeat Joker in 30 seconds and we should never hear from him again. Lock him in a cell and that's it. Doesn't that's exactly right. You've, yeah. you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. And the fact of the matter is, is that I've been saying for a decade, at least that dark side has not been, uh, played to his full potential in the DC universe. He's been in re- he's been in repeated storylines throughout the DCU over the last ten years, and he's always been downplayed. He was even in the pages of Wonder Woman, and then ultimately ended up in the pages of uh, Justice League Odyssey. Which, by the way, Justice League Odyssey, out of all the Justice League titles in the last three years, is the best Justice League title to get. It's the most interesting. It's actually it, it was actually it played out. It did a crisis level story the best out of all of them. Uh, uh, as as a credit to uh, as a credit to uh, Dan Dan Abnett and all the all the guys who who ultimately worked at the ending of uh, of of uh, Justice League Odyssey. And in any event, it was it was very well done. There was more than there was more than one writer on it, but it started off with Joshua Williamson and then it went to Ryan, then it was corrected. And, and in any event, it's good to see Darkseid back. But for what it's worth, Darkseid was always see, this is what people don't forget. If people forget about in the old multiversity, even when there was only 52 Earths, there was multiple sp- Supermans, multiple Wonder Womans, multiple Batmans, but there was only one Dark Side. There was only one Apocalypse and one High Father. There was that was it. Dark Side was there was only one Dark Side, and this is really not anything different than what has come before. All this is is Dark Side now exists in this new multiverse or omniverse, and what he's done is that now. Not only is there before there was only one dark side in the multiverse. Now there's only one dark side in the omniverse. At least that's how I'm interpreting this. He's 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 sort of sort of sucked in or absorbed all of his the aspects of himself. And and it's as it should be. He is the ultimate power. He's not just multiversal. He's omniversal. And that will make that's what makes him a threat. And I suspect that he's not just a threat to this multiverse. I suspect he's a threat to the judges of creation as well. That's why the judges of creation warned Wonder Woman about uh, or alluded or hinted at a larger threat. It's because the judges of creation themselves know that they can't contain him, can't contain Darkseid. That's what I'm thinking. That's what I hope because Darkseid is DC's Thanos and he deserves to be treated accordingly. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you hundred percent. And yeah, to your, to your point about him not being used correctly for many years didn't harley quinn go to apocalypse during well, <laughs> humphrey's run and defeat dark side even yeah i mean i mean on. i know well, well harley quinn also defeated the trinity in heroes in crisis i mean <laughs> i mean this just goes to show the the whole i mean it's comics right i mean it's i mean i mean to, i think it was kirk music who once said i mean it's it's easy to make it the easiest it's easy to have any character defeat another character. All you have to do is change the writer on it. I mean, it's, it, it all comes down to the writing, but it, it all comes down to how you perceive a character. And by the way, we should mention the Snyder cut. Look at the disrespect that the justice league movie did under Joss Whedon. You know, all of a sudden dark side, wasn't the bad guy. And now with the Snyder cut, finally we're getting dark side as the bad guy. I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, just when we're getting the Snyder cut and the HBO and the four chapters of the Snyder cut with a uh, focus on dark side as the villain in the Snyder cut of the justice league that we're getting dark side, making a resurgence here in the DC universe comic books. I don't believe that's a coincidence. Yeah. Hopefully they, they do him right. And he stays up there. He, he should be like you said, the, the, the Thanos. That's a good, good comparison. He should be the Thanos of the DCU. Uh, well, let's move on. Batman 106, uh, written by James Tynan, Jorge Jimenez on art, Tameo uh, More on colors, Clayton Cal on letters. I don't have much to add to what I said previously. Um, I, I will mention the Jorge Jimenez art in here. It's, it seems really messy to me. Um, there are panels I, where I absolutely love it. There are other panels where I, I, I've seen him do, do better. So the inconsistency of the art bothered me. Um, and the color work is just, it's so busy. There's like, um, it's like they're Tameo More, 
who's an incredible colorist and, and very versatile. It's, it's like they're asking him to, to give us all these lights of, of Gotham, right? Like everything's going to be happening at night and it's dark. So give us all these different light sources. And it, it just makes for a really, it doesn't look good to me coming off the page. I don't, I don't, uh, you know, I don't care for it. As far as Simon Saint and the beginnings of the magistrate, um, I, that is interesting to me, especially with uh, Mayor Nakano kind of not wanting it. Um, but then apparently Simon Saint is behind the, the scenes pulling strings um, to bring fear to the, to the citizens of Gotham. So Nakano is going to have to bend to the political pressure and give people what they want, apparently is what it looks like it's going to happen. I do find that interesting. The problem is I know where it ends up, right? We know the magistrate is this huge fascist organization in future state that I don't have much interest or frankly, the stomach to read any more fascist, fascist stuff. I'm done with the fascism. Um, and that, that's really, so that's not a, necessarily a fault of, uh, of Tynan. That's just a personal thing for me. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm barely hanging on to Batman by a string. I don't think this is a bad story. I don't think technically it's, it's constructed poorly. Um, I think it's, it's good. And we're starting to finally see some of the ramifications of Bruce having lost his fortune finally. Um, and, and I find that to be interesting, but again, it's just a personal choice for me of, of, you know, who the villains are. Um, and I also wonder about, okay, we, it was Joker, Joker, Joker for the last, I don't know, decade. And now all of a sudden it seems like scarecrow, scarecrow, scarecrow. Can we not just focus on one bat villain at a time? There's so many of them. It seems like they did a better job in the nineties of swapping the villains in and out. Um, but we got plenty of scarecrow in future state. Now we're getting scarecrow and, uh, in the regular Batman title. It's like, eh, enough already. Uh, the backup story is the Damian Wayne Robin story. Again, don't have much to say about it. I've never been a Damian fan. Um, he goes back to his mom and says he wants to take his rightful place as uh, the head of the, the League of Shadows, um, take back his role as the grandson of the immortal Ra's al Ghul. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, you're going to go around killing people now. I, I guess, you know, you haven't learned any, didn't learn anything from being with your father. Not surprised. Damien's a crap character in my mind, so I'm not going to read it. Um, and it's just one more reason for me to not pick up the, the Batman title. Although I don't think he's necessarily going to be in the Batman title that much. I think it's a backup for this issue of Batman and a backup in Detective Comics 1034. But then starting in April, he, I think is where he gets his own title written by Joshua Williamson with art by uh, the same artist that's, that's drawing this uh this uh this backup feature gleb melkinov um so uh i don't know that's it uh, i didn't really particularly care for this issue of batman i'm in for at least one more but after that i don't know if it doesn't if it doesn't start speaking to me a little more i i'm probably gonna have to opt out of it uh, but well, I know I, you, you really liked it rocky what, what what do you think well i, I do and I, and I think that i think teeny in the fourth is is crafting a larger narrative here and i'm on board for it I'm really impressed what what he what Tini in the fourth managed to do in 22 pages here is impressive. We we were introduced to the Unsanity Collective. Arkham has fallen. Gotham must grapple with the new sanity. Join the Unsanity Collective and the new Gotham. We're, we're introduced with Ghostmaker, team who, who's now fully teamed up with Batman. So this is someone who's an equal to Batman. He's not a he's not he, he's a partner, but he's not a sidekick. Um, and I really like the rapport between Ghostmaker and Bruce Wayne. It's something that we haven't really seen before. Before, it's always been a sidekick dynamic. This is more of a partner dynamic. I like Ghostmaker. We got we got this Master Wise. We got Simon Saint. We got Mayor Nakano. We got this the Scarecrow, and we we know that. We know that the the scarecrow is likely using the insanity collective to to deliberately stoke the fear of the citizens of Gotham, and that ultimately is being used uh, by Simon Saint. Uh, that indirectly is helping Simon Saint by stoking the fears that that benefits Simon Saint because he wants Mayor Nakano to implement his his magistrate program where he can initiate his peacekeepers that we know will ultimately be part of future state. And we have to keep in mind that future state is not written in stone, that it's a, it's a potential future. It's not written in stone, although it's a potential likelihood. And I, although it's a criticism of future state that maybe it's unclear that it's written in stone or not. I actually, 
I wish we never got Future State because, quite frankly, I would I would have enjoyed this Batman 106 even more had I not known about Future State because there's so many moving parts here with Batman 106. I just think that it's it's a shame that we had Future State that sort of ruins some of the surprises that we know are coming. Yeah, I, w- I would be. I wouldn't be considering jumping off <laughs> Batman if, if not for future state. I just, I'm sick of the magistrate at this point, to be honest. Yeah. With you, so, but I, I want to give a, I just want to give a criticism of the uh, Damien, Damien Wayne story because I, uh, uh, and it's a criticism of Williamson as a writer too. Uh, even though I, I like the art by God Melnikoff, the problem here with Damien Wayne is, you know, look, he's supposed to be, I believe he's supposed to be, what 16 years old is he 16 years is he's got to be between 13 or 16 years old in this narrative and he's now he's now gone back to the same mindset he had when he was 10 years old yep but when he was 10 years old it was lovable because he was a narcissistic 10 year old he was a narcissistic 10 year old prick and he was kind of enjoyable to hate but you, you didn't hate him you loved him he was 10 years old you were prepared to cut him some slack i'm not prepared to cut this damien slack anymore he's now 16 or he's older and now he's just an unlikable asshole. I don't like him. I don't like him. He's a jerk. And I don't know, maybe he's undercover. Maybe he's doing this. Maybe this is all misdirection. Maybe he wants to, you know, he's quit Batman. He wants to go join and he wants to be, he wants to assume the, ta- you know, the Raza Gaul empire and be the new demon head, whatever he wants to be. This we, We've seen this song and dance before. And I hate to say it, but I've, I had to endure a hundred issues of uh, Williamson's The Flash, where every single story arc was Barry Allen relearning the same lessons after lesson after lesson. And at the end of his Flash run, Barry Allen learned absolutely nothing, and he didn't he didn't grow as a character. And there wasn't even a, there was there was not even the illusion of change there wasn't even the illusion of a character development and it was never a character driven story with williamson the characterization is always the same i predict that i've got no reason to believe that this is going to get any better i think williamson's robin i think i think i think damien is going to remain the same character that williamson thinks he is he's going to be unlikable if he's going to be a jerk I'm sure he's going to end up killing some people. There's going to be dramatic moments. And then it's going to end with Damien after 100 issues going back to being the jerk he always is. I've got very little faith with Williamson that he knows what he's doing with Damien. I hope I'm wrong, but I just I just don't see it. And this 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 is so predictable. It has all the tropes. I, you know, all the lessons. Just just as an example, Jace, think of Super Sons. What did people like about the rapport between Damian Wayne and John Kent and Super Sons? And look what they've become. Look what they've become. If, if you're a fan of Damian Wayne and a fan of John Kent from Super Sons, imagine the level of disappointment you knowing that this is where they end up. John Kent, the tyrant, and Damian Wayne. No excuse for being an asshole. Learn nothing from his friendship with John Kent. Learn nothing. Becomes bitter. Dad uh, leaves his dad. Goes embraces a, a a psychotic narcissistic his grandfather. I mean, this is now again. This might all be misdirection, and maybe Damian Wayne's. This is all part of Damian Wayne's master plan. Okay, fine. But I don't like the story. I don't like the story, and I don't think Damian Wade would abandon his friends or his family in order to make a point with his mother or or Raza Gall. I just don't like it. And again, it's the whole approach of putting drama over more hopeful, fun stories. Yep, I agree. Agree 100%. Uh, well, let's move on to uh, the next title, Crime Syndicate number one. I'm a big fan of the Crime Syndicate. I had... Had high hopes I was going to like this uh, particular issue, but I, I don't know. It kind of it kind of fell flat for me. Didn't didn't really do it. Uh, it's written by Andy Schmidt. Pencils are by Kieran McCowan. Inks by Dexter Vines. Colors by Steve Olaf. Letters by Rob Lee. Um, I thought the art was okay. Um, I think that it's a little inconsistent at times. Uh, there's times the line work is really great, and there's other times where it feels uh, a little. A little incomplete so it might just be uh some growing pains um because i'm not sure i've ever seen art from from this artist before so uh he may just be getting kind of getting uh getting used to it uh color work is interesting steve olaf is a, a veteran color artist and so 
the color choices are, are interesting. Um, and I, I think he's trying to, to sort of mix the bright colors you'd expect with a superhero comic with some, something a little less bright, a little more muted in terms of, Hey, this is earth three and you know, things are, are not good. This is an, an evil place. Um, but I think overall it would have worked had I been a little more okay with the, the character and the, and the story. And, this, and, and, you know, maybe if you're not familiar with the crime syndicate, then, then you'd have no problem with it. And we've had different versions and I'm fine with that, but there is no crime syndicate here. It's just us being introduced to the individual characters. They're not even working together. And I, and I get it, right? These are villains that are analogs for their heroic counterparts from the regular earth. But, and, and it's always been a dysfunctional team, but at least there was some semblance of team here. They're all just individual. Maybe this is going to be the story of them coming together, but I don't know. It just, it, this story didn't speak to me, especially because a lot of the characters have been changed for no reason I can discern in terms of what they look like. And apparently, apparently, uh, Superwoman is not Lois Lane, not this amalgamation of Lois Lane and 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 uh, Wonder Woman anymore. It's Donna Troy now. I, I, I was like, wait, what? It's different, yeah. Why is it? Why is it Donna Troy? Um, I did like the fact that Oliver Queen was president, but I actually I absolutely hated the fact that uh, or the look of the the new uh, the new Flash analog. I, I was like, um, why does he? Why is he running around with goggles on and he's bald and he's got no shirt? Like, it, it, I was like, what? Yeah. Uh, you know, John Stewart is, is powering now again. What? I, I don't know. They just seemed like changes for the sake of making changes rather than, than having a reason for it. So, so I don't know. Ultimately, I was, I was disappointed. I always say read at least two issues. So I am going to read the second issue. I, I pre-ordered issue one. I pre-ordered issue two. I did not pre-order issue three. I'll pick it up in my LCS if the second issue uh, turns me around. Um, I thought the best sequence was the Owlman sequence at the end. Um, he seemed the most true to who I know Owlman to be, as opposed to the the others, which felt very, I don't know, just not not who I know the, the crime syndicate to be. Uh, the backup story for Ultraman, again, I, I talked about it previously. Um, it's Andy Schmidt writing, Brian Hitch doing the pencils, or art, Alex Claren colors, and Rob Lee on letters. Um, it's just been done better, and it's been done before. So seeing the the, the origin of um, of Ultraman, I feel like isn't really necessary. People that are going to pick this up, they're for the most part going to be familiar with these characters. We all know who Ultraman is, um, and if you want to go read a interesting, you know, origin story of um, an evil Superman again. I'm going to point you to Irredeemable by, by Mark Wade. So, I just felt like it would have been better served to use these pages from the backup to give us more information and flesh out the characters in the first story. And tell tell me wh why is it Donna Troy now? Why is it John Stewart now? Why does um, oh God? I can't. What what is the Flash's name? Uh, I have him here. Um. Well. Um. Johnny Quick, that's what it is. Yeah, Johnny Quick, yeah. Why does why why does he look so I don't know, white trash with no shirt and tattoos and bald <laughs> and whatever? I, I I rather would have had that. So anyway, I think you enjoyed it more than me, Rocky. What what did you think? Um man, my friend, I respectfully disagree with you. I, I had so much fun with this issue. This put such a big shit eating green on my face. I love this, man. I just, I found this entertaining. I, I found myself laughing out loud. I mean, how can you not laugh? I mean, Donna Troy is telling President Oliver Queen to, to start, you know, using his tongue. I mean, uh, she wanted lip service from the President Oliver Queen. You know, I mean, she's, I mean, there's, there's so much going on behind the scenes here. It's just. I, I just enjoyed this. Even Washington, D.C. It's not Washington, D.C. It's Arnold, B.C. Because Benedict Arnold was the one was the hero of American history, not George Washington. The traitor Benedict Arnold was. I mean, this is hearkening back all the classic things. John F. Kennedy wasn't killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. He was killed by a young Ultraman who finally let go of his parents who, you know, he was tired of his parents holding him down. 
and and he was moving past them and he, and the backup story of Ultraman explains why and and even the uh, uh, everything about this the, the way this story progressed I it just put a freaking smile on my face because even Ultraman like with you know his he's so narcissistic and he he thinks everyone loves him and and he expects to be worshipped and 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 many of the people even kind of do and then there's Cat Grant at the Daily Planet you know who's willing to publish that expose on Ultraman and and this Ultraman is not as deadly he's not as uh, inclined to use lethal force as maybe Grant Morrison's Ultraman was in the Earth Two hardcover that he did you know. Ultraman threatens to, I mean, I loved when Ultraman threatened Cat Grant that if you don't, if you don't retract that expose you did on me, I'm going to, I'm going to kill everyone in the planet, even the janitors. <laughs> it's like, really? You're going to kill the janitors too? Who's going to clean up the mess? I mean, the whole thing, like, I, I just, there was a humor to this and a, it almost felt a little bit satirical to me. Maybe it was the mood I was in when I was reading it, but I enjoyed this. And this was, this was, you know, this is Earth 3. And and the way I've always viewed Earth 3 is that to be a good person on Earth 3 is even more challenging than to be on our Earth because the natural inclination for everybody on Earth 3 is to be an asshole. And <laughs> and I love the fact that, you know, we get these we get these lead characters that suddenly they're taking over this Earth. And, and this is the, their origin. To my knowledge, Jace, I don't think other than maybe in the Silver Age, which I, I don't recall reading, I, I, I don't think we've ever gotten a formative origin for the formation of the crime syndicate. And that's what we're getting here. So unlike you, who I, uh, you know, I appreciate that you wanted this to start off with them together. I kind of, I'm curious as to how they end up together. How does this superwoman, this Donna Troy from Demon Island, not Themyscira, it's not Paradise Island, it's Demon Island. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I mean, I've always criticized Paradise Island for being filled with feminazis to begin with. But on Earth 3, at least they call it what it is, Demon Island. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I obviously I'm having, I say that tongue in cheek, obviously, but I have a lot of fun reading this. I love the badness of it, the evil of it, and Starro attacking. And remember that Starro attacking is significant because in our Earth, uh, the Starro attacking was the, is the Starro attack is what led to the formation of the Justice League on our Earth in our comic books. Yeah. So Starro attacking here is leading to the formation of the Crime Syndicate. I think that's very appropriate, and I like that. And I think it works, but it's going to be very, very different because when Starro attacks, Starro wants to take over the citizens of Metropolis mentally. But Ultraman is so insulted by that. He says, if I can't control him, no one can. So he kills. He, he uses his heat vision to kill the citizens of Metropolis because he doesn't want Starro to control him. I mean, that's how psychotic Ultraman is. I don't know. I I, I love this. I, I thought this was a. a a little bit of satire in there, but it, it, it also is deadly serious. I, I love Donna Troy, man. I, I, it doesn't even bother me that this isn't Lois Lane. Uh, in fact, where is Lois Lane? That's one of the mysteries here. Does Lois Lane even play a role? We got we got Donna Troy in this, as Superwoman. We got Cat Grant as the editrix, the editor of the Daily Planet. Man, I, I'm, I'll stop talking now. I can go on, but I I, I just... I really enjoy this and I'm uh, I'm looking forward to more issues. Yeah, I mean a great job on Cat Grant, I will say. You know, if 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 Earth 3 is the the backwards earth where people act, you know, the opposite of what they are. Yeah, we get a a a confident and capable Cat Grant. Um and so I did I yeah, she was probably my favorite part of the the issue. So, I I will say this, you know, I I I mentioned it before. I always give at least two issues. I think you need two issues, especially if it's a, the first issue you try as a number one because they're so hard to do. What could swing this around for me, you know, and just thinking about it? We haven't met Alexander Luther yet. And if we get Alexander Luther and he's a, a character that I can, you know, relate to and identify with and root for, he could be the, the reason that I, that I pick up the rest of the, the series. So I guess, we'll, I guess we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on to another number one. Uh, it's the new Swamp Thing, new version of Swamp Thing. Um, this is written by Ram V with art by uh, Mike Perkins. And I, I don't know. I'm, I've never been a big 
Swamp Thing guy. And I, and I think Rocky's kind of the, the same way. So it, I, I don't know that I'm the right person to say pick this up or not. But I, I will say this. It is, um, it, it's constructed very well. You know, it's, it's Ram V. So in terms of uh, the pacing and the dialogue and all of that, it is. It's very good. It's it's paced and it's e it's an easy read and it's I think it's very good for yeah and and the you know the dialogue there's you don't have to have to have to worry about hokey dialogue but for me it wasn't you know again full disclosure not being a swamp thing guy we're getting a, a new version some Middle Eastern guy which I guess you know Ram V is the one writing it uh, and I should mention Mike Spicer does the colors and Adida Bidikar does the letters. Um, but this is the same creative team that gave us the, the future state swamp thing as well. I should add that. Um, but it's, it's, this is not Alec Holland. So we're really going in a, in a different direction and we're told so little about this, this new vessel for, for the swamp thing. Um, but what we do know is there's, uh, we're kind of introduced to, I guess, who's going to be sort of his nemesis, right, right from the start. Um, yep. But the, 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 the pale wanderer the pale yeah. wanderer I, yeah. I love that name i love that name but what i thought was interesting so much of it you know the pale wanderer he's out wandering the desert and you're talking about swamp thing and you relate that to green and all that and and but yet it like a huge part of this happens out in the desert and and this new this new uh swamp thing levi Kame, even manifests for the first time at Swamp Thing out in the desert. It's right in the name, Swamp Thing. Why is it happening in the desert? Again, it's just a, it's a, it's a little nitpick. Um, I don't know that I'll be on board because again, I'm really not a Swamp Thing guy. I, I, maybe I'll read one more issue. It, it, I thought it was done really, like it's technically a very good comic. It, I, I think the reason it just didn't speak to me is because I'm not that interested in, in Swamp Thing, but I did wonder about the whole, why is the desert playing a role it's called swamp thing we saw no forest we saw no swamp we saw no massive amount of vegetation not that the desert has no vegetation we know there's cactus and other kind of plants out there but i just thought that that was weird it, it would make sense that his nemesis this pale wanderer would be of the desert but why is he manifesting for the first time out there instead of somewhere else and he's coming back from india another place you don't necessarily think of as you know, I've never been there, but I don't necessarily think of India as, you know, huge vegetation and swamps and that sort of thing. You know, like where's the Florida setting? Where's, you know, you could even go Africa or Brazil where you think about places with a lot of green and plant life and, and whatnot. So uh, but I think if you're a Swamp Thing fan um, that you should be excited because Ramvi is an incredibly talented writer. And I think the Mike Perkins art is, is very visceral and, and kind of scritchy here. And I think that that works as well. So. Uh, I know you're not really a Swamp Thing guy either, Rocky, well, but what, what did you think? Well, uh, I am now. I, oh, yeah. I, I thank you, uh, Jace, uh, because you have me on your, your program and I feel privileged to, to be here. And, and, and I'll be blunt, I, I only read this because we were reviewing it and I'm glad I did because I'm going to buy it now. I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. What, what impressed me, I, I could care less about Swamp Thing's past. If this is well written, I shouldn't need to know Swamp Thing's past. And I don't know a lot about Swamp Thing's past. I probably know some things f just from sheer osmosis over the last 40 years. But I mean, frankly, I'm impressed. Uh, this the character work here is what sold me. I I just love this. This played out cinematically to me. This starts off with a murder in the desert. Uh, a couple of sh a sheriff and his deputy having a conversation about uh, about the about the history of the area, referencing a pale wanderer. And suddenly we were immediately delved into the lore and the mythology of what's happened in this in the past in the Arizona desert, going back to the times of the Civil War. It, it captivated me. I, I loved it. I thought Mike Perkins art did a fantastic job conveying the, the mood and the atmosphere. This Levi Kemai, he's from India. He he came to America when he was 16 years old. He he's in America for 10 years. He works for Prescott Industries. Prescott Industries sends him back to India to do a land deal. He goes there not only to goes back to his home of India, not only to facilitate the land deal for his corporation that he works for, but also to to have a reckoning with his dad because he had a falling out with his father, and. And there's family secrets there. And meanwhile, he's this this lead character, the protagonist, Levi Kame, he's having these 
blackouts. And when he has these blackouts, he, he sees the swamp thing. And of course he doesn't know it's the swamp thing. And we readers know that, uh, but he's having these dreams and, and he even dreams of his, his own brother, Jacob, having a dark, uh, engaging in a dark, in a, in a dark bargain of some kind that it's hinted at. And, uh, in any event, we, um, there there's, and then his father ends up, uh, dying and there's, we're not really sure exactly, but he, he talks about the beauty of his father dying, but also the horror of it because he has these images of the swamp thing. And there's, you know, when he ultimately ends up having a hallucination or some sort of manifesting as the swamp thing in the Sonoran desert in Arizona, and he confronts the pale rider, that's where we get the theme of this comic. And this is all in 22 pages. What's so impressive is that the pale wanderer says to him that, you know, the best ideas endure, but you're just an idea now. So I'm going to, and, and he kills Swamp Thing. And he's not afraid to kill Swamp Thing because if you're a good idea, you're going to come back. You can't kill a good idea. I love that theme. I love that, that philosophy. And I, Ram V, you know, V made me think here. And I really enjoyed this thematically. And I'm definitely on board because this wasn't just a Swamp Thing uh, story. It actually, it had something to say. And I'm definitely on board. Man, Matt, now you're thinking, making me think maybe I should be picking this up. I, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what you, what you said. Um, I guess it just remains to be seen. I, I mean, certainly this has the beginnings of, you know, a great run where you, people are like, Oh, have you read Alan Moore Swamp Thing? Have you read Neil Gammon Sandman? You know, a definitive sort of uh, run on, on a particular character. Uh, all right. Last book we're going to talk about Suicide Squad number one. This is written by uh, Robbie Thompson. We have pencils by Eduardo Pantica. Letters are by Julio Ferreira. Colors by Marcelo Maiallo. Um, And all I will say is God damn it. I've been saying it for how long will somebody finally listen to me? Amanda Waller is a goddamn villain, not an anti-hero, not a, Oh, she treads one side or another, or, you know, a politician. She is out and out evil. Uh, and she sh she's showing her true colors here. She imprisons Rick flag. Uh, she's, you, you know, the body count is higher as high as ever in a suicide squad book. People are dying left and right. She doesn't give a shit. Um, but ultimately it was, it was interesting. I just don't know that I can keep reading a book that has Amanda Waller in it. Cause I can't stand her as, as a character, but this, I thought this was in interesting and entertaining, um, and seeing peacemaker who we know is unstable leading the suicide squad, I, I thought was an interesting dynamic. Um, the, the issue starts off and they're going to, to rescue, uh, Talon from, uh, from Arkham Asylum. And the other part that's cool about that is it, it ties in with, uh, with other things that we've seen in, in terms of the DC universe. Like as they're going into Arkham to rescue William Cobb, Talon, um, a day happens. Like, you know, the same scene that we saw in Infinite uh, Frontier Zero, the same scene that we saw uh, in, in Batman where the, the, that Joker gas has been released but not really Joker gas because nobody laughs. Everybody dies silently. And to Rocky's point earlier about it looks like somebody's trying to frame the Joker. Maybe it's Scarecrow who uh, is just trying to instill fear. Um, so I, I do like that, you know, they're at least trying to keep a little bit of continuity. Um, I mean, they keep telling us that, that everything matters and it's continuity light. And I, I feel like the, <laughs> I almost feel like whether well, they're putting things in, in this book where they're tying in events so that the editors and creators at DC can point to it and go, no, no, we still care about continuity. Look, look at Suicide Squad number one. We see a day there. We saw it over here. That's not really what we're talking about when we're talking about not, you know, um, paying attention to continuity. We're talking about longer timelines, not just tying one issue into another. But, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, ultimately, this 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 was a really entertaining issue. Um, I thought the artwork, the, the pencil work by Eduardo Pansica was spectacular, especially the fight scenes. They're visceral and they're kinetic um, and they're, they're awesome. Seeing uh, the Talon, um, you know, just beat the crap out of people is always entertaining. Um, so despite my not, like I almost, 
this is another situation J- just like rocky was with swamp thing only reading it because we were covering it i only read suicide squad because we were going to cover it because uh, i haven't been a big fan of robbie thompson's work in the past um but i read this and, I, and despite amanda waller being in it uh, i did enjoy it and i thought it was thoroughly entertaining and maybe it's because she's not even pretending anymore um and i really hope i really would hope at the end of the first or second arc that she gets her comeuppance, that would be the best thing for me to see is Amanda Waller thrown behind bars or killed or some consequences of her actions because she's so goddamn evil and gets away with it constantly by putting the blame on other people. And I just want to see her pay for what she's done. Um, but the, the one quibble that I, that I have about it though is, and again, you know, we saw this in future state that, that Connell, that uh, Superboy was part of the suicide squad. I just don't feel that he, he really fits in. Um, and and really, is this where DC, is this where you want to have this beloved character in a a really sort of dark dystopian title? Um, and you know, if that's their choice to make, it's not mine. I mean, I don't own the character. Um, but I feel bad for, cause I know he's beloved. Um, which I never understood. Like remember Rocky when he, uh, first debuted after Superman died and he was the metropolis kid. (laughs) <laughs> and it was the 90s, so he had kind of the, <laughs> the flowy hair and the yeah, denim He looked jacket. ridiculous. And the leather jacket. Yeah, and people hated him because he was kind of like a punk. And yeah. then he ended up getting his own title, and eventually he morphed into the jean-wearing black T-shirt with the red symbol, short-haired Connell. And then all of a sudden, he, he was beloved. And I, I think that transition took place in the, the Jeff Johns Teen Titans. But, but I never yeah. – I missed that era. So I never understood why he went from this arrogant – sort of young Superman that people didn't like to being like this yeah. beloved character. Yeah. And then he was gone for a long time. I don't know. I just feel bad. Um, I don't know. Maybe if your name is Superboy, DC just has to give you the short end of the stick. So I, I, I'm not, I would not be looking forward to seeing, um, seeing Amanda Waller basically torture Connell, uh, which is, I imagine what's going to happen in order to get somebody heroic like him to, you know, become part of the team, manipulating oh. him, pulling his strings, that kind of thing. Eh. I don't know if I have the stomach for that. So, but I'm I'm definitely in for one more issue. We'll see how it goes. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on it? I well, m- maybe I'm maybe I'm misunderstanding this, and I I can stand to be corrected. But this we 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 already know exactly how this is going to end. Now, I I read you and I both read Future State Suicide Squad number two, and my understanding is this Amanda Waller from this Earth that we're reading in this issue of Suicide Squad number one, which takes place before a future state, she ends up, they break out Connor Kent and William Cobb, the talent, out of Arkham Asylum, and they form part of her new Suicide Squad that she takes to Earth 3. And they end up, and and Connor Kent ends up being trapped on Earth 3 at the end of future state number two forever. And, and to be their new Superman. To be Earth 3 Superman. Isn't that what happens? <laughs> Yeah, it That's, is, but uh, so I mean, I uh, the only thing I'd, I'd say to and that, then William Cobb dies, and William Cobb get William Cobb gets killed in Future State Suicide Squad number one. So this to me, this is all. I mean, again, I agree with you on the the you know the right the writing is good, the dialogue's great, the artist and work of Panzeca fantastic, inks Julia Ferrara great, but we already know how this ends, and Amanda Waller dies. We know we know she dies at the end of Future State issue number two. So um what's you know i'm not really sure what the you know i mean it's it's okay i guess but i just don't understand what was the point of future state because we just lost all that suspense well again but <laughs> I mean, you you yourself said this earlier in the episode the future state it's a possible yeah you fair know, enough. possible future <laughs> so all i can think is god i hope that connell doesn't agree like eventually he revolts against her maybe he's the one that'll make her pay maybe we can get a uh, a Wonder Woman Maxwell Lord moment with Connell and Amanda Waller. I would, but, but, I would, just, I would have that blown up and hung up on my wall. Connell snapping Amanda Waller's neck. Here, here's my criticism though, is because if the future state issue of Suicide Squad number two, if future state Suicide Squad number two is still the future, Amanda Waller rede- finds redemption. She, she, this was all part of her master plan. Her master plan was apparently to get Connor Kent to become the Superman of earth three, because I guess earth three must need it. And then they, they section off earth three from the rest of the multiverse. 
and they they cut it off so it's got no no one can go to earth three anymore that's my understanding yep. it, it's really really kind of weird why amanda waller of, of our earth would of earth designate zero would give a rat's ass about earth three other than the fact that I, I don't know maybe her family was kidnapped or something but i never really understood that maybe i got to reread it but i it just seems to me to be a little bit uh again this is ex- this is an exciting issue for what it is but the fact that I read Future State actually takes away from this issue because I would have liked to have had the suspense and a lot of those. I would rather have the que- more open questions at the end of this issue than to have read Future State before reading this. That was my only criticism. But that's not the fault of the writer, Robbie Thompson, or the artist or, or the creative team on this title because this was well written and, and well, well crafted. Yeah. And, and Robbie Thompson didn't write the Future State story. I can't remember who did off the top of my head, but. I want to say yeah. Jeremy, maybe it was Jeremy Adams. Um, yeah, I think you, I think you're right yeah. on that. I'll have to look. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you and, and, you know, I hope that, that enough people like, like this, that they, they jump on board because I, I do think it's, it's interesting. And Suicide Squad's yes. always sort of, a, it, it never has the best sales, but it always kind of hovers right around the cancellation mark and, and we'll see. And I mean, and let's all face it. If it wasn't for the fact that Peacemakers in the James Gunn suicide movie, he wouldn't be here. Um, yeah. but <laughs> but he's a but, good character though he, yeah it's not it doesn't feel forced this feels yeah. he's a well-written character robbie thompson does a really good job i like peacemaker i want to see more of them and frankly i don't even mind if we get rid of uh the other uh uh rick flag thank you if we get rid of rick flag i mean god love you rick flag but peacemaker is just more he's more interesting <laughs> yeah i agree 100 percent. rick flag to me has always been kind of a boring character he's like cyclops uh, back yeah. in the day where he's the kind of the hall monitor always follows the rules. You know, there's no, there's nothing interesting about him. Peacemaker. Uh, it doesn't really come across here, in the, but he's so unstable. Um, yeah. You know, he, he can flip. I mean, I, I, I go back for me. Um, if you ever read the, the Marvel Wolfman uh, written and edited um, vigilante series with Adrian chase, the one through 50 where peacemaker shows up because these terrorists have, have um, they're holding a plane hostage on the ground at an airport and mm-hmm. Peacemaker shows up and then Vigilante shows up. And it's not the Adrian Chase of Vigilante. If, if you've read that story, the the who wears the Vigilante mask yeah. several times throughout the series. But um, it's actually Adrian Chase has become a judge at this time in the Vigilante series. And his bailiff, Dave Winston, I think his name is, is taken over as Vigilante. But he's, <laughs> he's a, a Vigilante who doesn't kill. He uses rubber bullets and all that. Anyway, he shows up as well in the plane to try to stop the hostages and peacemaker vigilante meet and uh peacemaker is so unstable he goes no i'm here to save them turns around and just like a scene right out of indiana jones pulling the pistol out you know and shooting the guy with the 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 sword he just shoots dave winston just you're dead i don't want you here you're dead wait peacemaker (laughs) you're supposed to be a good guy here to rescue these people vigilante's on your side you just killed him and it just shows how unstable peacemaker has always been uh, yeah. so I look forward to that. I look forward <laughs> to seeing more interaction between Talon and I don't know, man, just if you could take Amanda Waller out, I would really be on board on board for this, because then I wouldn't worry about poor Connell being manipulated and psychologically tortured by by anybody. But I guess she's so inherent to who the Suicide Squad is. So I don't know. She, I, I actually find Amanda Waller. Amanda Waller is a character that unfortunately every single writer seems to write her in the same tropey fashion that they she's always a duke ek machina character to yep. me she always seems to have every single time she's got a backup and now uh, you could you could argue that so does batman but i actually think that amanda waller has one up on batman in terms of you know batman often they they will at least give batman some flaws or he'll make a mistake or something but amanda waller rarely does yeah. and uh, it's all it always seems that they always try to overcompensate for Amanda Waller because she's this uh, overweight character who, you know, they want to they, they need to compensate for the fact that she's got no superpowers. But all she is, is a uh, is a I don't know, is just some strong willed uh, human working for the government. And she's one minute she's indifferent. And the, the other minute she's compassionate. And then the next minute she's crazy. And then the next minute she's, you know, she's blowing heads off of. of of suicide or suicide squad members. And then, and then the ne- the next she's cutting them some slack. 
there's rarely consistency there. And I, and I actually think that I'm, I'm hoping that there's a little bit more consistency there because even between future state and the future state suicide squad in this first issue, I think there's an inconsistency there. And, and even they even threw in an earth three version of, of Amanda Waller, which further confused things yeah. at one point that that's a topic for another day. When we talk about the future state, uh, when we, when we talked about the future state titles, but uh in any event, it's to me, they, they got to be careful with they, they got to work more on their Amanda Waller characterization, I think. Yeah, or just take her off the board and create a new a new character. <laughs> I think it's time. I think it's time. Um, you know, she's she's like you said, she's so tropey. You know, this idea of this, you know, overweight black woman who, you know, grew up in poverty and came from the mean streets. And God, it's just so reductive, you know, like at this point, I, I just get rid of her and come up with a new character. To me, she's beyond redemption. But that's just my my personal my personal yeah. feeling. So but that's good though. She's, she's a character that we can love to dislike or hate. That's good. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot to work with there. I just think that they should, you know, they should, I think she deserves a little bit more of a in-depth storytelling than what she's gotten. Yeah, I don't I mean that, that they should eliminate her. Uh, I just think they should work a little bit more making her a little bit more, uh, you know, have more, ha- just have some more in-depth storytelling focusing on her motivations and her background more because she's a little bit too much of a mystery. And, you know, you and I shouldn't be, we have a difficult time getting a handle on her, but I think, I think the devil is in the details, but I think she's a diamond in the rough as a character. And, and I think she's got a lot of potential. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. I, I don't find her to be interesting. So, you know, to your point, if you could add some layers that could make her interesting, and get some consistency of characterization and not just have her be this, this plot device that, like you said, always has a backup plan. Um, and just this unrepentant bitch, then, you know, maybe I could get on board with her. So she's the, she's the Amanda Waller who laughs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Well, uh, I think that's going to do it for this, uh, this episode. Whoa!